la iniciativa Cerebro y Aprendizaje. Un coloquio anual organizado por el Colegio de los Alcaparros since year 2017. In just a few moments, we will start the conference. What are the necessary conditions for creativity? Given by Lena Puckley, founder of the Keeping Creativity Alive initiative. Before starting, we want to recommend you to follow the instructions on the screen to guarantee the best experience possible. To use the interpreting module, please click on the interpreting button at the lower toolbar on Zoom and click on it. Select the language you prefer and then select off if you want to listen to the event in its original language. If you have any problem with this tool, you can please write through the chat and we will answer your questions. Questions done through the chat will have less possibility of being answered. So please click on the Q&A button, also in the lower toolbar of Zoom, and write your question. We will do our best to answer the highest number of questions. Thank you very much for joining us. Les presentamos a Rosita Caro, fundadora. We'd like to introduce you, Rosita Caro. She is the director and founder of the School Colegio Los Alcaparros. Good morning to all this community that has decided to join us in this process of having these conferences about the brain and the different topics that we've been working on. We are in now our fifth conference, which is Brain and Creativity. And in our third specific talk on the creativity series, I want to greatly, warmly invite Lena Pugsley and the different deans and principals that are joining us from the different associations of UNCOLI and UCB, and also associations from school, the teachers and the staff from the Colegio Los Alcaparros. And of course, I want to also welcome families from the school and the schools that are joining us today to think and reflect about the different conditions that make it possible not only to have an education based on creativity, but also the care of the minds of our children so that they are creative children. Creativity as a topic right now is at the forefront of all 
the different responsibilities that we as educators have, because this un very uncertain world and this world that is certainly giving us the opportunity to renew ourselves in many fronts, well, it is guiding us to also renew the perspectives we have in education to our children, and it definitely puts as a focus and as the central axis, creativity. So I'm sure that we will be very pleased about this talk. So Dr. Lena Pugsley is a master's in the sciences of creativity, but I'd like to highlight, I think what's most beautiful about what I was researching about her work is that during, at the first, at the beginning of her professional career, she dedicated to really tackle and perhaps really challenge all the different myths towards or in regards to what is being creative about to provide a much more gentle perspective and perhaps even a much more comprehensive one where education of our children and the importance of creativity are closely related. She's also the creator of the Keeping Creativity Alive Center and she is also a creativity professor in Canada. So for Lena, creativity is a goal, is goes much more much more beyond what we understand. It is very highly linked to innovation and also highly linked to possibilities that still don't exist. I think that this talk specifically for our parents community and the teacher community will be unforgettable. It is about answering the question, well, how can each of us adults who walk the path of life with children can support, inspire, and care for the potential of creativity in our children. So thank you and welcome Lina uh, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Now I'll give the floor to Lina Puxley. Hello everyone, thank you for that warm welcome. I will share my screen. Hello everyone joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited to be here talking about a topic that I'm very passionate about, creativity and ways to keep creativity alive in ourselves and in our children. Today, we're gonna to talk about the conditions needed for creativity by asking this question, what are the conditions needed for creativity? Um, as Rosita had said, um, I'm the founder of Keeping Creativity Alive. It's an online resource created to support parents and educators in promoting and inspiring creativity. So this is a topic I've been exploring for the last 15 years uh, to better understand what makes us creative and how might we raise our children to meet their creative potential. So what I'd like to do is start with a question. So if we could all pull up the chat, oh, if we just pull up the chat. What I'd like to, to invite you to do is to answer this simple question in just a word or two or a few words. And along with the answer to your question, I'd like to invite you to, if you're, feel comfortable um, to write your age or an age range. You could say 30 plus, 40 plus, so on. Um, and for the children and teens joining us, please feel free to add your age also. So the question that I'd like to start with and ask you about is, are you creative? So go ahead and just type, um, you could one or two word answer or a very short answer to the question, are you creative in the chat, if you would. I'd like to get a sense of um, how you feel about your creativity. Great. Oh, great. I'm seeing yes is wonderful. All of us are creative. Beautiful. <laughs> wonderful. I'm seeing a lot of yeses. This is great. Um, ish. Okay. I like that limited. Yeah, I'm just sometimes we need to take a little bit more time because some of us aren't really sure, right? So it's an, an interesting question because I find that we're either really clear about it. Uh, when I go in and talk about creativity with groups, it's either a yes, I feel very connected to my creativity or no, I'm not creative at all. Um, and sometimes we're not sure. And sometimes we may be feeling disconnected from it or not even feeling creative at all. So we know that we all have capacities for creativity, but the real question is, are we still in connection with our creativity? And are we using our creativity? And if we're not, then why not? This is what really fuels my desire to learn more about creativity. So what I'm curious about is what makes a person feel more creative or more connected to their creativity? And 
whether we can raise our children to be more creative. This is a quote by the late Sir Ken Robinson. Um, his work has been celebrated, especially this past week. Um, it was his birthday yesterday. He passed away last year, unfortunately, but there's a lot that's been done to keep his legacy alive. If you're not familiar with his work, we'll be talking about it a bit, little bit later in this presentation also. Um, but this quote um, is really what we're talking about today. When I think about what it means to nurture children's creativity, I think we need to consider it in this way. I'll read it for you. The gardener does not make a plant grow. The job of a gardener is to create optimal conditions. So if we think about what the optimal conditions are for keeping a garden, it would be things like sunlight, water for the soil, climate, um, maybe the moisture, the types of soil, all sorts of things go into creating an optimal condition for growing a garden. And I believe we can look at preparing an environment for creativity the same way. And what would that look like? That's what we're gonna talk about today. So a little bit about me, um, I'm an adjunct professor of creativity. I've taught creative thinking theory and practice at Sheridan College um, with students across multiple disciplines and taught idea generation in marketing at Wilfrid Laurier University in the MBA program. Prior to getting my master's of science in creativity, I worked in the creative industry as an art director and an associate creative director in digital marketing at an advertising agency. And it was there that I learned about deliberate creativity and creative problem solving, and that you could actually apply process and tools to become more creative and to apply your creativity more deliberately. Uh, and I was really blown away by this. This was at the Creative Problem Solving Institute. It's the world's longest standing creativity conference. Um, if you're interested, I suggest you look into it. Um, it's wonderful. Um, and it was really a way of opening my mind to creativity in new ways. Prior to, to that, I had really thought about um, creativity and I had identified as a creative person uh, because I was artistic and I loved art and I loved to draw and so I became the creative one in my family um, and so I always identified with it but then when I went on to work in the creative industry uh, where there was a lot of pressure to innovate I started viewing creativity differently it was beyond the layouts and the copy that went into the ads but it was about the idea the big idea and how we could break through and come up with um, you know, uh, innovation and, you know, win awards and all of that. So really looking for something different. And when it came to creative a bit more as solving problems and coming up with new thinking. I also run workshops and classes with children where the focus is always on new ideas, exploring and possibilities. I love supporting parents and educators in, in promoting creativity at home and in the classroom. And I've also been researching parents' roles in children's creative development. And I'll share that with you today as well. So our outline for today, <clears throat> excuse me. First, we're gonna look at introductions, the foundations of creativity. Next, I'll share my research. Uh, third, we'll look at the conditions for creativity and get uh, deeper into that. And fourth will be more of a summary about inspiring creativity and what does that look like? Now, before we get started and in jumping into the first section, I have a creative challenge for the children on the call with us. Um, anyone who would like to join, I welcome you. I'm gonna walk you through it. This challenge is going to give uh, you the chance to have fun and to practice being an inventor. And it's really a chance, I mean, we're gonna be talking about creativity, but this is a chance for you to deliberately, you know, be creative and enjoy that. Okay, so there are two steps. The first step, is to select two things that you love or two objects in your home or wherever you're watching this from that you find interesting. And then what you're going to do is combine those two objects and see what new thing you can create using the two objects as inspiration. I'll give you an example. So my daughter, uh, her name is Evelyn, is 10 years old and she, um, she loves Fruitopia, the juice, and she loves poppets, these fidget toys. Um, I'm curious. Are these um, fidget toys poppets, are they popular where you live? If you could just type in the chat, I'd love to hear. So what she did was, yes, very popular. Okay, I thought they must be. So um, what she did was she combined these two items, her favorite thing, juice, and uh, this toy to create a prototype or a sketch. And so this is what I'm inviting you to do is to sketch your idea. And what she decided to do is make a giant pop it, um, in this case with one big circle in it, 
um, with Fruitopia as the decoration. And I wanna share with you her final product. And you might not get to the final product in our time today, but I encourage you to start if you're excited and you would like to create your prototype of your product or a sketch is absolutely fine also. But this is what we call a dimple. So it's got one and it's actually a working poppet. So I thought that was really fun to share. So I invite you to go and do that before you go. Um, and at the end, um, I would love to have some volunteers share what you've created in the time that you're with us today. So in the next 45 minutes um, or so, or, or hour to see how far you get. Um, you're not being evaluated. This is just for fun. This is not being graded or anything like that. So just have fun. Just gonna give you some examples of some fun inventions that were made. Um, so we've got, you know, I wanted to show this because maybe you want to solve a problem. Maybe your invention is going to be something that you're solving, like having Lego on the floor and stepping on it. We know how painful that can be. So this was a fun, just very fun invention that could help you with that or having cereal and being in a rush and make, having it on the go. So anything that you can come up with to bring those two items together will be great. Okay. Are there any questions? about that exercise for any, any children or teens or any young people at heart who would like to join us in this. Okay, well, if there are any cat questions, you can just raise them in the chat and I'll keep going. All right, so let's tackle part one, introduction. So I really wanted to start with creative foundations, um, a holistic model and framework for creativity, because before we can really talk about the conditions for creativity, we need to agree on what it is. So what is creativity? When you hear the word creativity, uh, what words come to mind? Let's start there. So if we could just type in the chat. Oh, great, Kaya, wonderful that you will participate. All right. So let's go ahead and just type in the chat words that come to mind when you hear the word creativity. Open-minded, imagination, thinking differently. Wonderful. Problem solving, original innovation, solving problems, smile. Oh, lovely. Connection, solutions, curiosity, change. Oh, this is wonderful. Well, I like to ask this question whenever I work with educators and before going in for workshops, I send a pre-survey and this is one of the questions that I ask. And then what I'd like to do is put together this Wordle that encompasses all of their input. Uh, and it's really interesting because the words that are bigger and bolder are the words that are said more often. Um, so just like you had said in the chat, we've got innovation, originality, inventive, imagination, different. Um, and of course, that is um, what we're, you know, talking about when we talk about creativity. What we also see are art, music, drama, theater, um, and all of the artistic aspects of creativity, which they absolutely are. But sometimes we can be limited in thinking about creativity as only the arts. And so I just want to clear that up and say, yes, it's part of it. But we're, what we're talking about mostly today is expression, yes, um, and, but also thinking differently. And so um, that's what I wanted to point out with this, uh, with this slide. Now, another thing I'd like to point out, um, what I love to see when working with teachers is they often say math and they say science. And that is, that is great because it is so much more than the arts. Um, we can be creative and think differently in math and sciences in all disciplines. So why is creativity important? Okay, well, we're not gonna spend too much time here because we know with all of the uncertainty and all of the change that we're experiencing in the world in the last two to three years, in the last two to three weeks, uh, we know that we, we don't necessarily know the problems that are coming at us in the future. And it will be our creativity that's gonna bring us new ideas, new perspectives and solutions um, and to help solve those challenges. So we're gonna need to do things differently than we have done them before. And that's gonna require some new thinking. Okay, I wanted to share this image of the sustainable development goals created by the United Nations. It highlights the world's most urgent challenges with the goal of more, a more sustainable future. So we need to do things differently, to do things differently than we have before. And part of the, um, the global call for creative ideas that we'll be talking about later, um, we'll be inviting you to look for solutions for some of these, these challenges. Okay, I also wanted to share this powerful quote by Brene Brown. It highlights the value of connecting with our creativity and why it's so important. 
It says, the only unique contribution that we will ever make in this world will be born of our creativity. Now, um, this, again, like I said, it really values, uh, it really highlights the value of connecting with our personal creativity, um, and it's what fuels me to promote creativity. I feel that our creativity is so deeply connected to who we are, who we really are, um, what we love, and what we're good at. So I think that when we can get in touch with our unique creative strengths and passions and what we are meant to contribute to the world, then we are empowered and we're connected to ourselves and what it is that we want to contribute to the world and what we um, are you know, inspired to do, what we're passionate about. And this is what really fuels me to understand how we can promote that more within ourselves and for our, the children in our lives. So defining creativity. Now, creativity is complicated. <laughs> But um, let's just look at a really simple way of looking at it. And this is sort of the most settled on um, a, you know, definition of creativity in the literature and in the research. It's really distilled it down to two simple concepts, the ability to generate ideas that are novel and that are useful. So having these two components, novelty meaning original or new or unique and useful meaning that it has value or that it has a purpose um, and sometimes they say appropriateness, and this has been somewhat debated, but um, this is sort of the most commonly agreed upon definition. Uh, now I'm going to take it one step further in looking at a more holistic view of creativity, uh, and this was developed actually in um, Oh, but it still is you day because it's a way of bringing in all of the other aspects of creativity that aren't covered in the very simplistic um, two factor definition earlier. So in the late, um, sorry, in the 1950s, Mel Rhodes set up, set out to find an all encompassing definition of creativity as part of his doctoral studies in education. So at the time he, um, this was in the fifties, he collected 40 definitions of creativity and 16 of imagination. And he wasn't happy with that. He wanted to settle on one concept. So while analyzing the definitions, he found that four strands emerged, the four P's. So we've got the person, how people are creative and the characteristics associated with creative people, the process, how people create or apply their creativity, the product, so these are the artifacts or the results of creativity, and the press, this is the climate surrounding the person, the process, and the product in which creativity either flourishes or is squelched. And so this is um, sort of the, the container that holds all of it is the environment. So the next thing that we uh, we need to consider is how do we support this? All right, so I'd like to take us to the, the next section uh, where I'm going to share my research. And we're gonna be looking at the role, um, looking at parents' role in creating a creative home environment. We wanted to know, are parents supporting creativity or are they supporting conformity? Ken Robinson, many of you will be familiar with Ken Robinson. Um, his TED talk from 2006 titled Do Schools Kill Creativity is the most watched TED talk of all time. It challenged the way children are educated and it argued for a radical rethinking of how schools cultivate creativity. I remember seeing this talk for the first time around uh, the, the birth of my first child. And he talked about children's brilliant creative minds and how we're educating people out of creative capacities. And I couldn't help but wonder, how might I raise my child to be creative, to feel connected and, um, and express her creativity? Um, let's see. Um, but as I thought about this, about schools killing creativity, I thought, well, what about parents? Do parents kill creativity? So this is the question that I set out to explore. What is the role that parents play in all of this? So I'll give you some background. Our study was published in the Journal of Creative Behavior, um, Supporting Creativity or Conformity, Influences of the Home Environment and Parental Factors. So together with my professor at the International Center for Studies and Creativity, Dr. Selcha Kajar, we set out to explore this area further. We wanted to know creativity, uh, or we know that creativity is desirable, but do we actually support it? There are a lot of studies, a lot of literature that talk about creativity and education. Um, and they, you know, they question, do schools support or do they suppress creativity? Everything from teachers' views, implicit views, 
uh, ways to bring creativity into the classroom. There's so much out there, but there's a lot less written about, um, about parenting and um, parenting and creativity in the home environment. Uh, another thing I wanted to raise here is micro moments in educational settings. So there is a, a research paper that talks about this. It talks about those little fleeting moments that happen often in a classroom where a child might come in and have a great idea they wanna share or they make a connection that takes what is being um, learned in the classroom, a personal connection, they think of it in a different way or they've come up with a problem in a different way. And sometimes there just isn't time for that in the classroom and sometimes it's those are missed or they're, they're not given time and space. And I thought that was interesting to call those little micro moments where we could encourage and support creativity. So then I wondered, what about the home environment? Is that happening there? We wanted to look at creative characteristics. So things like autonomy, independence, questioning the status quo and authority. And these creative traits are often seen as undesirable. And again, we wanted to know, are we valuing these creative characteristics at home or are we encouraging conformity and compliance? Now, there was a study done in 1997 in Australia. Um, and when I started researching and looking into this, there were very little, uh, there was very little out there in terms of the family context. But I found this study and it was really interesting because it actually looked at parents' views of creative traits in children and it looked at the home environment. And um, I thought, thought that was really interesting. And, um, and in many ways, our study is an extension of that study that was done in the 90s. And we wanted to know, you know, 20 to 25 years later, how have things changed? Have they changed? All right, so we needed to look at the parental factors, meaning, you know, what are the parental factors that predict support for creativity? What are the parenting styles that would promote creativity. And what we found when we researched is that authoritarian parenting has a negative relationship to creativity. So authoritarian being that extremely strict parenting style focused on obedience, discipline, and control rather than nurturing. What we found was authoritative and permissive parenting may support creativity, and there's mixed evidence um, for this. But typically, authoritative parents are nurturing, responsive, and supportive, yet, yet setting firm limits. Um, and per permissive parents tend to be very loving, but provide few rules. So we found that in some ways that can actually allow space for creativity, which was interesting. How about mindful parenting, a mindful parenting approach? <clears throat> we wondered about this. Uh, in recent years, especially, um, there has been a movement towards a conscious parenting, or they call it gentle parenting, or more respectful approaches. So we thought maybe nurturing parenting may be this, the solution. And we wanted to look at parents' values and support for creative personality, and we found that these are key. And this is from earlier studies um, that showed that parents' uh, values and support for creative personality are predictors of you know, support in the home environment. Parents who had more positive attitudes and values towards creativity prepared a more creative home environment. All right, so our research questions. Do parents support creativity more than conformity? This was the big question. Do parents' values and attitudes toward creativity, home environment, and mindful parenting matter? And who supports creativity more? mothers or fathers, teachers or parents. Now our study was focused on parents, but we had a colleague who was working on a study that also looked at teachers' views on creative traits. And so we were able to compare the two. Our research method. So we had over 1300 parents take the survey and over 900 completed the entire survey, which was great. Participants were reached through a parenting group on social media. And parents didn't know the purpose of the study, um, what it was about, or that it was about creativity. This is one of the measurements that we used. It's the, called the Torrance Ideal Child Checklist. So this is where parents are asked to indicate how important they consider each characteristic on the list to be. So they would measure it by um, on a five point scale, whether it was very important or not as important. And so they were asked to consider this um, you know, important trait or not, not in relation to whether their child demonstrates it, but just how they see it. 
And so this scale is used to capture parents' implicit notions of the ideal child. The original scale actually looks at whether you encourage or discourage the skill, so we modified it a little bit for ours. We also used a attitudes and values towards creativity scale to look at you know, questions around originality, your perspectives, and innovation. So for example, one of the questions might be, when solving problems, it is often beneficial to postpone judgment about possible solutions. And then you would rate that on totally disagree or totally agree. We also included a creative, um, well, we included the mindfulness and parenting scale to measure how um, parenting style might relate to um, some of their other views. Uh, we included a social desirability scale and a creative environment scale. So this was looking at questions such as, do you encourage your child to be involved in making family decisions? Or do you encourage your child to question your opinions and beliefs? Do you encourage your child not to make mistakes? So some of them were flipped to see, um, you know, measure different things around independence um, and respect within the family environment. And our findings. <clears throat> Parents reportedly support creativity more than conformity, even when their level of engagement in the parenting group was controlled. So this was great. And it was actually very different than uh, results from earlier studies that were done in the 70s and the 80s, where parents were more in support of conformity and compliance. So that was interesting and positive. Parents' attitudes and values toward creativity was the strongest predictor of support for creativity. So when they were positive for themselves, um, their attitudes and values, they um, showed more support for creative traits. Home environment is a positive predictor. And mindful parenting is negatively related to support for conformity. So this was really interesting because um, it showed across the board that all parents were more in support of creativity, but this particular group were less supportive of conformity. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So the big finding was parents rated creativity related characteristics more important than socially acceptable characteristics. So what does that mean? So creativity characteristics locals like asking questions are imaginative are independent in thinking and so they felt that those were important traits the socially acceptable characteristics are things like conforming competitive or trying to win and quiet and um, that was less um, supported which is, is also a great sign now i want to just back up a little bit and talk about parenting style again um, and respectful parenting. So early on, uh, when my kids were really young, I started really considering parenting style because I had this, because of my experience through working in advertising and thinking about thinking and how we come up with ideas, I wanted to better understand how I could help nurture this in my kids. And I, I started considering how I interact with them, how I respond to their ideas. And what I found was there's actually a philosophy that, that talks about this. And I was uh, really surprised to find this. Um, but it's called Resources for Infant Educators, or um, the acronym is RIE, R-I-E. And uh, it was developed by Magda Gerber, who was an early years um, educator who was very passionate about giving children trust and freedom and allowing them to follow their inborn curiosities and their inborn um, desires. And so it involves these things, uninterrupted play, so not guiding their play, not interrupting what it is they're doing, but allowing them to explore, being free to explore, um, having that trust to do that, um, following their natural inborn desires. So uh, um, giving space for that and giving time for that, teaching less and observing more with sensitive observation. And it's all rooted in respect and trust. Okay, so we actually um, gathered one of the groups that we were able to reach through um, with our survey was a group of parents who were aware of this parenting style and who were part of a group that were actively learning about it. And what we found were that of the group, we had them self assess on a scale from one to 10 how connected they are to their creativity. And we found that those who rated themselves higher as respect in respectful parenting knowledge had higher support for creative traits. And this was the group that was less supportive of socially acceptable traits. And so that's unlike the other group of parents who were not as well versed in this parenting. So that, that is a really interesting finding to me. 
because it says a lot about being conscious about um, our intentions in our parenting styles. So the results in terms of mothers versus fathers, there was no significant differences on creativity, but fathers value conformity more than mothers, except when fathers were well-versed in parenting, according to that last um, question we asked them. So we found that the traits that fathers value were completing tasks, quiet, playful, sociable, risk-taking, and mothers value becoming preoccupied with tasks, empathetic, and independence. Teachers versus parents. Okay, the, um, and like I said, we had a colleague who had also collected data about teachers' views of creative traits in terms of importance, and we ranked the order differences between teachers and parents, and they indicated that parents are more supportive of creativity than teachers. And this is not surprising when you consider all of the, um, the pressures and the, the environment and the expectations of teachers and the large group of children versus having a very small group. So the discrepancy between parents and teachers um, is not difficult to understand, and it's likely due to the way schools operate and are structured rather than a teacher's personal preference, because we know that there are many teachers who highly value, value creativity and who want to make it a priority, but are finding it can be a challenge. It can be a challenge when there are so many, so many children in a group versus a home environment where there are, um, you know, less children, no assessments. Um, it's a more relaxed environment. And so this is understandable. Um, now, this is a high school student's artwork. Um, they were given the task of creating an art piece that expressed their uh, school experience. And this is what this student had provided, um, very expressive drawing. Um, and it says things my teacher hate me for, my teachers hate me for, thinking differently, questioning too much, drawing in class, and not paying attention. Now, if we were to reframe some of these things, thinking differently is a gift because it, it's uh, the key to originality and being unique and looking at problems from you know, different ways, which is wonderful. Questioning too much um, shows curiosity, which is again, um, a wonderful thing to have when we're looking at uh, ways to approach problems. Um, drawing in class um, and not paying attention. Now these can indicate a number of different things. It could be that they're autonomous. They don't wanna do what they're being asked to do in the moment. They have ind independent minds, um, wanna do what they wanna do. So a lot of ways, uh, in a lot of ways we can reframe some of these things and look at them differently. So reframing creative traits. I have this list of possible negatively seen traits and how we might reframe them into non-conforming behaviors or creative traits. Okay, so we have impulsive lives. We could look at that as being fully in the moment. Sorry. Um, talks too much. That could be passionate about ideas, challenges authority, rule breaking questioning too much, curious, unconventional, original, uncooperative, could be autonomous, obsessed, maybe they're passionate about something, sloppy or careless, could be an indicator of a busy mind, lots of ideas, could be a great divergent thinker, uh, temperamental, um, could be emotional or sensitive, which um, are traits that are positive for creativity, um, or withdrawn, might be that they're observant and they're just taking things in. So I think that we can really start to reframe some of the ways that we look at uh, traits that we see in our students and our children. So key learning from our study, we learned that parenting style matters. Fathers and mothers experience creative traits differently. Parents are more supportive of creative traits than teachers. And parents' attitudes about creativity prepared a more creative home environment and were more supportive of creative traits. And what we also know is that there is not a lot of research about creativity in parenting and home life. Um, since our study, we have seen more, uh, but we need even more research in this area. Uh, this is a study that came out since, which is great, looking at parents' um, creative self-concept and how they feel about their creativity and how does that influence the home environment. And some future research that is being done um, that I'm taking part in is how to care how do kids view their parents' support towards their creativity? So how does that, how does that play in? So that will be interesting. All right, so I'd like to take us into the third section, uh, which is conditions for creativity, creating possibilities for creative growth.
And I, I'll start with this quote here. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So this speaks exactly to what we're talking about and fits within our garden metaphor. So we cannot change and we cannot fix a person, but we can create better conditions to optimize the possibility for growth to happen. So I'm just going to read this quote again. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. All right, now this is a book that speaks to this um, exactly. It's called The Gardener and the Carpenter by Alison Govnik. She is a psych uh, psychology professor. She's also the author of um, a fascinating book called The Scientist in the Crib. Uh, in the Scientist in the Crib. Her work looks at cognitive science and how babies and children learn. And this quote by her, um, I'm just going to read it out. Children are such naturals at learning and playing and innovating that parents should just loosen up and let them do their thing. We can't make children learn, she writes, but we can let them learn. Uh, another quote by her uh, that she says is, let them be who they are, not who we want them to be. So I find this very powerful. She sees parenting as a construct that was invented just in the last several decades. Um, and her ideas come, um, come from the idea that it is better to be a gardener, to protect and nurture space for plants to flourish rather than a carpenter, which is attempting to shape something um, using materials into a finished product that you've predetermined. So you can see how this analogy really plays into um, you know, what we're talking about with creating conditions. Now we know that there are a lot of different ways to creativity and there isn't exactly um, a roadmap on how to be creative or exact conditions. But if I were to create one, it would look sort of something like this, a lot of interconnected elements, um, you know, going between the creative person, the creative environment, the creative process, the creative mindset. And then I have this cluster um, of connection, curiosity, and respect. And that's what I'd like to talk about first. So this is what I call the model for creative growth. And that, that's my desk. Um, years ago, I really wanted to pinpoint what it is, what I was instinctively feeling about how to nurture that um, creative potential in a young child. And I'm think, I was thinking from birth, from the time that they're infants and babies and young children, how can our interactions with them you know, translate into allowing them opportunities to practice exploring, to practice using those creative skills and traits right from the beginning. And so I created this model to capture what I believe are the key components for creative growth. So the first is curiosity. So having a sense of wonder and intrigue, um, having that strong urge to understand the world around them and how could we you know, be aware of that and be aware of fostering that. Connection, the parent attachment or bond, responsiveness, a greater sense of security. So through having this um, connection with the child, then we've, we're creating the safety. So we're automatically creating opportunities for them to, to feel free to explore and to feel confident in trying and taking risks and those creative um, aspects. And respect. So a res uh, respect for the child, respect for oneself as the parent and for possibilities, being open to possibilities, respecting the ideas that come up. So I felt that these three factors together um, really speak to um, sort of the non-tangible things, the, the things that parents can do um, just relationally uh, with children in their parenting that can promote without actually doing something, you know, without actually um, setting up an activity, but it's just how we are with them. This is a formula that I absolutely love and wanted to include. It was developed by a mathematician who was a creativity scholar named Ruth Noller. It is creativity is the function of an individual's attitude driving his or her knowledge, imagination, and ability to evaluate ideas. So within the brackets, we have knowledge, imagination, evaluation. So key components for creativity and combined that, that um, allows us to be creative. But the function of attitude driving all of those things is what's really key in this, in this formula and in this definition, because we can have those, the knowledge, imagination, and evaluation um, in place. But if we don't have that attitude, 
um, we can see that it might not go as far. And so I took uh, the model that I had created of the three components and I scaled back and I wanted to see what are the conditions, what are the things surrounding, surrounding that model? And uh, what I believe are attitudes and values, and this goes back to our research about studying attitudes and values, and it showed that when parents had high attitudes and value for creativity, they were more encouraging of the traits in children. So that is key. So based on your core beliefs, well, having a belief that creativity is important and wanting to encourage that is key. Um, outside of that, I would say mindset. So being open-minded, flexible, playful, affirmative, um, and also suspending judgment, which is um, really a huge part of it all. Um, having the ability to say yes and rather than no but. Um, and suspending judgment because that can really shut down ideas. So allowing things, allowing ideas to take place, even if we know that they're not going to work. Um, just letting it be and see what happens. And awareness, being aware of when you're in or out of sync with your attitudes, values, and mindset intentions. Uh, noticing, sort of making note, um, and making note of your awareness and where you are. And, and so the, the thing about this is I believe that we can have the right attitudes and values towards creativity. We can have the mindset, um, but sometimes we can can um, have moments where we're not in tune with that. And if we can have that awareness of noticing when that's happening and choosing differently to, to, um, to reframe and to look at it differently, because uh, sometimes we don't, we don't see uh, um, opportunities for creativity that might exist. So I've also put in here also known as the hard part, because I think this, I really do. I think that this is the hard part is having that awareness um, and being able to apply it um, in your home life is hard. It can be hard. All right, now I wanted to share this because there are so many articles out there that talk about nurturing creativity, ways to nurture creativity, step-by-step -step list. And, and I enjoy those articles. I think um, there's a lot of good value in them, but this is my favorite one. It's by Adam Grant, um, who's an organizational psychologist. And he talks, and the, the title just says it all, how to raise a creative child, step one, back off. So I think there's a lot of humor in this, but there's also a lot of truth to this. Um, there's also a quote that I'd like to share. This is, um, this is from a 1960s conference panel discussion among leading child psychologists, educators, and renowned creativity researchers. Uh, and I actually had the transcript. So um, in the creativity library, when I was doing my master's, um, I found the transcripts to this conference and you could see exactly what each of them had said to one another. And this part stood out. My piece of advice is to love children, but leave them alone. And so I thought that was really powerful because when, when they say leave them alone, they don't mean leave the house and leave them unattended. They mean uh, provide a safe environment, um, you know, be sure that everything's fine, but to really get out of their way in the sense of uh, we don't need to be directing their play. We don't need to be controlling what they're doing. Um, we don't need to be scheduling them all the time, but we can really step back and allow things to play out, allow them to make some mistakes, allow them to take some risks. We don't need to correct them. So that's what that, that piece of advice looks like. Um, and, and I think it's, it's really relevant. Okay, so now I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit and um, look at the creative climate dimensions. This is a model created by ECFAL um, that is still used in organizations and across many different fields from education. Um, and I wanna look at how we can apply this to the home environment. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through each component looking at the first, which is idea time. This is um, time to elaborate new ideas. So giving space and time, risk-taking, willing to experiment and put ideas forward. So having a safe place where you can do that. The third is challenge. So having joy and meaningfulness in their work, investing that energy, feeling that they have a sense of purpose in what they're working on. Freedom. This is the autonomy to problem solve, make decisions and share information. Idea support. And this is where ideas are received with attention, respect and positivity. So affirmation. So we're we're looking at idea and we're like, oh yes, what else could you do? And really giving them time and space and support for, for new thinking and new ideas rather than shutting them down and saying, oh, we can't do that or didn't work before sort of thing is, is be taking um, a positive approach on that. Dynamism, liveliness, 
So looking at new things and new thinking and having some energy there. Trust and openness. This is emotional safety in relationships. Very key. Playfulness and humor, spontaneity and having fun, just being lighthearted about it all. Debates. So recognizing and respecting diversity of opinion and, and being able to see things from different perspectives is so key um, in a climate. And this last dimension is actually negatively correlated to creative climate, which means um, it's not something we want to encourage, which is conflicts, personal, interpersonal, or emotional tensions are not conducive to creativity. So now I wanted to share this beautiful play space uh, within a home. And this photo comes from the Workspace for Children, who has um, an online presence really big on Instagram um, and a business that promotes play for children and supporting parents on how to set up an environment and, and how to help children have that independent playtime to be, um, you know, engaged and get into that flow state where they're just really loving whatever it is they're creating, they're experimenting, they're trying new things. And so I just thought it was a beautiful, beautiful space. And this is, of course, an early childhood educator who has collected these materials um, and play, play things over time. But your play space doesn't have to be this elaborate. Um, this is just this this was a corner of my living room um, in one of our old houses when I had when my kids were younger and we called this the workstation or the art station, uh, depending on what they were working on. Um, but this could just be one little section of your home. It could just be a table. Um, you could also call it a tinker table where there's just an opportunity to access materials um, to make some of those ideas and visions come to life. I talk about I talk about this in the classroom think tank book. So you might be familiar with this book. There were some prior sessions talking about it. And I have a chapter in the book called um, Five Ways to Inspire Creative Thinking at Home, which are a little bit more deliberate ways like the, the Tinker Table. And I'm going to be sharing a couple more of those um, here. So Book of Ideas is an idea that I love. Um, and it was actually inspired by my masters. Um, in my masters, they encouraged having a system or a way of keeping your ideas in one place. Um, and this really promotes the, the idea of idea time and dedicating time to really giving your, you know, ideas a chance or space to live by documenting them somewhere. So um, I invited a number of kids to participate in creating a book of ideas to capture their ideas, inventions, thoughts, doodles. It was anything that they wanted it to be. Um, so it's meant to be a meaningful creative practice, capture inspiration, explore their interests further, celebrate creative thinking and valuing those new or different ideas. And here's another example of um, a few children who decided to create idea books of their own. And what I love about seeing this is how they have taken their ideas and decided to have to ideas based on different things. You know, princesses, little green monsters, or in this case, things that I can do when I go on a family vacation. Um, this is a, an example of reserving idea time in a classroom setting that I did with a class. Um, and I wanted to include it because idea time doesn't need to take a lot of time. Um, this is a design thinking tool called Crazy Eights. And what you do is you can take this template where the page is divided into eight boxes, or you can simply fold the page. So it creates eight boxes. And you would give one prompt for each box uh, to come with, up with an idea towards whatever project that we're working on. Okay, so... Um, so you would read the prompt for each box and spend one minute capturing an idea in the sketch. So it's a great way to come up with a lot of ideas in a short amount of time. Okay, this is one of my favorite childhood memories uh, where I, uh, we were um, visiting family. We're from Cyprus. So we were on the beach in Cyprus and my uncle brought his old car and he gave me free reign to paint anything on the hood of his car. So I feel like this represents freedom, idea support, risk taking, playful, trusting and liveliness. Okay, wonder books are another great way that you can capture curiosities by including different um, wonders in these books. And I'm just gonna run through these a little quick, more quickly, but this was a first grade class that um, added their wonders to their books. Characteristics of a creative person. We talked about this earlier. Um, I just wanted to highlight some more characteristics of a creative person, flexibility, open-minded. This is what they look like, curiosity, optimistic, 
original, able to suspend judgment, seeks problems, non-conforming, asking questions. So which traits do we value? We need to hire creative people, Ms. Caulfield, but they need to be good team players, fit our corporate culture, and not ask difficult questions. See to it. So we might question sometimes whether we're actually looking for creative traits. Um, some of you may be familiar with this if you have these books. This is a, a children's author who, um, who got in trouble. He got in trouble in school. He did not have a good school experience because he was sent to the hall every day. He liked to draw and make up stories. Um, and he, um, he was really disruptive. He, he, wasn't, uh, a, he wasn't the ideal student, um, but he went on to use that gift, use those skills. And he's the author of several, several books, uh, Captain Underpants, you might be familiar with them, or Dog Man, um, and many books have come out of his creativity. Um, just a really quick story. Uh, I went in to do an, a creative art workshop in a class. And whenever I go in, students get really, really excited and they want to ask me, um, or they want, they come up and they get very excited and they tell me, I love art. I'm so glad we're, we're doing art. And this particular day, this little boy came up and said, I love art. I, I know what I wanna do. I wanna create Lobzilla. And he went in explaining how he was gonna mash up a lobster and Godzilla. And I went in with a different plan. We were also gonna do animals, but with a different focus. But I just decided, you know what? Um, we're going to change it and we're going to do animal mashups and we did it and it was great. So I think sometimes we need to demonstrate flexibility if that's something we're looking for in our students. Another uh, creative example um, of divergent thinking and possibility thinking is um, providing something like paper clips and saying create all the things that you can think of, um, you know, turn it into lots of different things. And so this is a way of practicing possibility thinking. And one last story about um, design thinking. Okay, so I ran a design thinking challenge with a class where they were asked to improve your friend's recess experience. Okay, so they had, they had to map out what was their recess like and what were the high points and what were the low points. And then they were to look at the low points and see if they could suggest things that would make their experience better. And the, the goal was to come up with wild and crazy ideas. And this was the result of one of them. Um, this little guy created a flying teddy where he would fly in with his um, you know, boosters and he would have all the materials ready that you could fly in and he would play with him and he would have crayons and all sorts of things. And then we also prototyped them and he prototyped this and it's just a way of um, you know, allowing opportunities for imagination. So I have one last section. Um, it's going to be very brief because it's a summary. So inspiring creativity, what does it look like? So often we think of what can we do to inspire creativity in others, but I'd like to shift our thinking about this and think about ourselves. The first, get out of the way. So we don't necessarily need to be doing something for someone else, but we can create the conditions by doing it for ourselves and modeling it. Notice, celebrate and encourage novelty doing things differently. So, so my suggestion is to do things differently yourself. Um, you know, change the way you do things. You, sometimes we get it stuck into our habits and our patterns, but be deliberate about doing those small things differently, even if it's walking, you know, walking to work a different way or walk, going for a walk in a different direction. Those little small differences come and play out later um, also. Asking questions, imagine, play, experience increase. So experience creativity, experience it for yourself and do it. Be aware of judgment. So this is letting go and being open to possibilities. Create and support idea time. Make this a priority for you too. And I have actually a gift that I'd like to leave you all with. It's a download from my website. Um, so I'll be sending, I'll be putting a link in the chat. Um, and so it gives a guide on how we can create some time for ourselves to venture into our creative, um, creative connection. Value and appreciate your creative strengths. So um, I wanna leave you with this slide. Um, this was a project that I worked on when I was developing my, um, when I was developing my um, understanding my creative styles, my thinking preferences. Um, and this is a profile of myself and my child. And um, I, I really think it's important that we look within ourselves and we recognize our strengths, our creative styles, the way we do things, and then really look at our children to see 
what is it in them that makes them creative or how are they looking at things differently? How are they the same as yours and how are they different and how can we celebrate that um, moving you know, in the future? All right, so this was, um, this was when my kids were younger, we had just mopped the floors and they decided that this was an opportunity to create an invention. So they called this the swimsuit walkover. This was their way of getting around my wet floors, um, keeping their socks dry. Um, and I thought it was the perfect moment, um, perfect micro moment for creativity. Um, that was pretty clever and, and a great way to end here. So please um, stay in touch. My, um, all of my handles are here for social media. It's, it's keeping creativity alive. Um, I'd like to welcome you to come to my website to, um, to claim the, the, just a free download that I created for you all that where you can continue to, um, to foster your, your own creativity. So thank you. Um, I'll just take a moment now to, to invite you all to participate in the global call for creative ideas. The world needs fresh and innovative ideas. That's why we're asking you to participate in the global call for creative ideas. And we are asking people of all ages from everywhere. What we are looking for is for you to tell us what you think is the biggest problem facing humanity. Is it poverty, hunger, climate change, well-being, and mental health? You tell us. Use your imagination and creativity to share your new, bold, and potentially disruptive solutions for it. And for those in the education field, we are asking that you think about what you see as the big problem in education and how we might fix it. To help you with your process, we have created a Cerebro Creativo series of talks. In each talk in the series, uh, it will help you develop your idea, so don't miss out. We hope you will be inspired to participate. Join us, listen, and ask questions of some of the world's leading creativity experts. We are looking forward to seeing your ideas. As I said, everyone from everywhere is welcome to participate. Submissions are open until May 31st and you can register today. Then the voting on the ideas um, will take place later and top voted ideas will be announced on June 14th. And the selected ideas will be featured in the next edition of the Classroom Think Tank. You can send in a five minute video or a two page photo or documents, you can be creative with it. And everyone can join the Penn State University Creativity Study and thereby help contribute to research about creativity and how we can help to promote it. Great, thank you. Bueno, pues, muchísimas gracias, Lina. Creo que todos... All right, well, thank you very much, Lina. I think we all are in a current situation that challenges us with the past of education. And we certainly know that we must break it. And I think we, we have just seen the, the amount of paradoxes that education has, right? Between what it has been in the past and what it currently is and what it is transforming into and what this future is also opening up to. And the whole change of context, the mindset change and shift, which means educating children in a world, in an environment and in a context that certainly promotes and fosters creativity. I will just take a moment to introduce to introduce Felix Duran. Felix Duran is our, well, he is the ambassador of the World Creativity Project for Latin America. Felix is one of the creators of a company called Innovation. This is an innovation company and they are facilitating the innovation project for Colombia in terms of innovative ideas. Felix, welcome. Would you like to tell us what your role is within this very marvelous project on creative ideas? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much, Rosita, Lina. This presentation was spectacular. Thank you. And also thank you for Thank you to School Los Alcaparros for this space. I'll tell you a bit about me. Well, I also come from design thinking and the design industry for over 15 years. And we basically, since six years, we are 
hosting the World Creativity Innovation Week, which basically seeks to develop all those skills and abilities that Lena mentioned and referred to. And we work at a Colombian level, but we are also from Colombia, we are creating impact in over 50 countries, and we are very much aligned with the World Organization, which is the World Activity and Innovation Week. Sorry, World Creativity and Innovation Week. So I'll tell you a bit about what this is about. So this is a, an event that seeks to highlight these values and celebrate the potential that innovation has to transform the world and specifically currently working in the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. So this current year, we are launching the sixth year. We have been doing this since 21 years, since it started in Canada. So we will focus specifically on collaboration, which is something that we uh, find absolutely necessary nowadays to, to for all of us to contribute collectively and to really boost the potential that these tools have to change the world. So we have an event that already has a certain tradition and a culture since from Canada with a focus on the cultural and scientific aspects and how we can inspire innovation in all ecosystems so that we can exchange ideas, experiences, and knowledges. And this is organized um, from the work activity, World, World Creativity and Innovation Week, the WCIUW, and we as IKU, this is the company that organizes this event in Colombia, and we call it in Colombia the Semana CI, or the Creative Commons Model Week. So we seek to, through different dynamics, to for people to participate. And we want people to be educated, linked, and empowered so that we can open the words to the, the world of possibilities. And we also want to foster, well, this competitivity also in the regions and this interaction between different actors of the ecosystem. So at a worldwide level, we have over 80 um, country members to help us uh, drive this event since year 2001, since it started. And the official day of this event is the 21st of April. It is celebrated as the UN. This is the day right now and acknowledged as the UN as the day for innovation and creativity at a worldwide level. We've carried out different celebrations. We started in, we started in year 2015 in Bogota, year 2016 in the city of Cali, and 2017 in Santander department in Colombia, carrying out different events during different days. In 2018, we were present in Panama and in 2020, there was a change obviously to remote mode due to the pandemic due to the pandemic so we um have launched now this version and we reached over 700 people in over 11 countries and last year we talked about education and we had guests bestsellers uh, guests such as michael gelb and others i think we've also had different interactions with the audiences, such as workshops, conferences, panels, even visits to different spaces. These are some of the guests. John Cabrera is another bestseller that has been invited. And Jim Friedman is the director and some members of the board from different countries in Latin America. So this current version will be, will be carried out focusing on collaboration and oh, beyond celebrating, we will work on a, a reflection about the creative solutions that can certainly contribute us, uh, specifically in this conflict times we are living. So how we seek how we can calm these tensions and create the tolerance to really avoid reaching war situations. So basically the first day will be on 20th of April, we will talk about collaboration cases, both at a local and national level. And we have, we will also have guests from the LATAM network, and we will highlight how collaboration has certainly been a way to develop impact programs. And on the 21st of April, we will carry out a jam session where we will be inviting different musicians so that we can collectively and jointly build and perhaps in a non-provised way. The idea is that creativity can really flow and that we can create uh, a song and sing towards respect, tolerance, idea creation and the creation of different collaboration space. So these, this is the proposal. I'll leave the link on the chat so that you can perhaps register if you're interested and keep an eye on and a watch out for the launching of this event. Well, thank you. This is all from me now. And through Sofia and through the school, Los Alcaparros, you are also welcome to contact us. Well, thank you very much, Felix. We will definitely keep an eye out.
to participate in this very excite, very excite, excitable event. All right, Lina, the two students that you've now assigned to this challenge and that have replied in the chat, we've just read them, so we will turn their cameras on. Kaya, Nobres, and Julieta Guerrero, they want to present to you the result of the challenge that you propose. So welcome, Kaya, and welcome, Julieta. Hello, Kaya. I am 10 years old. Um, my favorite things in my house were this cactus that I got from my room and um, this pillow, which is the one that I sleep on because I like to sleep. <laughs> uh, my invention is can you help me? It's like um, when you're sleeping on the pillow while well, you're sleeping. And then when it's time for you to get up, um, it, like, it's like an alarm clock that um, that like wakes you up with spice, but it doesn't hurt you. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a cactus alarm like clock. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wonderful idea. That would certainly get me out of bed. I think it would. I think we need that in our house for mornings where my daughter has trouble getting out of bed. What a great idea. How did you come up with that? Um, well, my, oh, I was thinking Put them together. It, and I had like two days to think. Um, and since I don't like get up, uh, early <laughs> sometimes yeah. I decided to do that because sometimes it is really hard for me to get up all right they say they say um they say that we get our best ideas from problems that we are experiencing so that is wonderful thank you so much for sharing Kaya what a great <laughs> idea by combining those two very opposite <laughs> things thank you And I believe we have Julieta, who is also going to contribute um, your idea. Yes, we're right here. Ah, hello. My name is Julieta. I am six years old. And I chose my bag and, and show her your drawing. So these are gummies and a backpack. Oh, so your favorite things are gummies and a backpack and you've combined the... Yeah, by Dude, basically... The so colorful. Backpack that you can eat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that would come in very handy after school when we're hungry and needing a snack. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. That was a great idea. Down. Thank, Thank you. you. Muy, muy bien. All right, thank you very much, Kaya and Julieta. We will now reply to some of the questions that we've received from our audience. So we have three questions, three main questions that we want to approach. The first question for you, Lina, which should be, which is, in your opinion, the main challenge that we have both as parents and as educators to really have an immersive experience and in a, in a proper accompaniment for children? to foster their creativity, which do you think are the main challenges, the main barriers for this? Right, so, uh, well, I believe the main barrier, there's a, there are quite a few, I think. I think there are a lot of challenges for parents and for educators. Um, sometimes we, we uh, can be very busy. I think that is one of the main challenges. Um, we fill our days with a lot of things and sometimes we don't have the time and space to stop and slow down and to, recognize some of those creative moments or to be patient and allow um, some of that independence and autonomy that we want to encourage. So I think that um, that can definitely be a busy lifestyle is probably the, the biggest challenge, I think. Um, also, we want to do so many good things for our children. We want to sign them up for activities and give them experiences and exposure, but that can be that can be uh, detrimental, I think, when we fill their time and we're not allowing for that time and space to play and to just explore your own interests and your own curiosities. 
And so um, I'm going to say time as, as the biggest, um, the biggest obstacle. Um, and then I think it's also, um, what are we prioritizing? It's asking that question, you know, what is the priority? Is it to have a lot of accolades and accomplishments and do really well on the test? Or is it to try something new and different and maybe fail a few times and, and get better and then realize something later? You know, there's, there are quite a few challenges, but I would highlight those two as being, you know, time and expectations and feeling that pressure as being things that can get in our way. Gracias, Lina. Thank you, Lena. I have very two interesting questions. Well, the first one has to do with the recent experience of the pandemic that we all were forced to live and the growth in terms of video games, right? The increase in video game, in video game time. And the question is exactly up to which extent while video games and, and playing time uh, of children in this specific activity could perhaps foster or not foster or perhaps become a barrier or the question is how to face this from a standpoint of an education to foster a creativity. How, what is the standpoint that we should have in terms of technology and video games that were obviously protagonists during the pandemic? Oh yes, this, this is a huge question because we all struggle with it, don't we? Um, I, I know, you know, anyone who has it figured out, I mean, tell the rest of us because there's so, you know, it's such a challenge is technology because I think what we all found um, and I'm just speaking broadly, but in the pandemic that we, uh, technology became a way of connecting and communicating with friends and with peers and there were games that were happening. And so there was a connection that was happening that was missed, you know, when we were not able to meet in person. And so I think that is where it became more challenging to pull back on some of the technology. Um, but I think we need to look at what we're using technology for. And so are we using it in ways that we are being creative with it and that we are, you know, putting ideas into it. Are we, you know, are we creating something or are we using it to consume? And so I think that's the distinction we need to look at and maybe creating, uh, I mean, my idea around that is creating some barriers around that so that we're limiting some of the consuming time, um, allowing a little bit more creating time. And I think the same goes for um, the school environment. I mean, a technology um, is the way of the future. Uh, there are so many amazing apps that can be used in the classroom and at home for learning. And so I think it's important to look for ways to integrate that, um, but in ways where, again, we're using it as a tool and not using it as, you know, maybe a crutch or something in parenting that you just do to fill time or, or you know, that sort of thing. So I think that it's important to think about. Um, so in terms of consuming, I would say, things like um, consuming videos that others create. So there, there can be some value, I think, to learning um, through like DIY, do-it-yourself videos. Um, you could consume content in ways that um, you are still learning and you're still getting something out of. I mean, it's very entertaining, of course. Um, but what I mean by consuming is really more like watching YouTube videos or something that someone else has created and or even in social media, things others have created that you're just taking in. Versus, versus create a, creating an example of that might be um, a drawing application or learning to, how to use Procreate or learning how to make animations or a stop motion video um, or Minecraft is excellent you know, for spatial um, creation and creating worlds and all of that. So I think those are the distinctions, but I, think, I do think we have to be very careful around technology um, and our children and be very protective of what what is being consumed online, what they're being exposed to, and all of the games available. Thank you very much for this, because yes, this is a very important topic, and it's important to stay alert, uh, specifically to how technology is consumed and how to foster uh, the educational environment at this moment with, well, having, for example, uh, screens on or screen soft or self-regulated habits that are important for children and students to also foster their own creativity in their own time. Let's talk a bit about those resources and those ma that material that is abundant in preschool and schools. What type of content of resources do you advise for, for creative thinking? 
how should we think about the, the resources and materials that should be available in schools in regarding to this topic? Yeah, well, I think um, in terms of physical materials and resources, I think it's wonderful to have opportunities for kids to go back to using their hands um, and using and building things, prototyping ideas. Um, I really, I really feel that that's where we come alive is when we're able to take an idea that we have um, and not be worried about evaluating it right off on the outset, but by, you know, exploring it further and being able to create something and have, you know, have that experience of failing, of working through a challenge and all of those things. So I think to a certain degree, it is materials in terms of having that availability of things you need to create with. Um, I can tell you from the design thinking I spent the one day with the grade two class working on that design thinking challenge. And we started with interviews and then it quickly moved on to building the prototypes. And the number one thing, the number one resource is cardboard. Make sure you have a lot of cardboard <laughs> and, you know, and then all the other things, pieces of wood and all those things, um, if they can be building, I think that is wonderful. Um, but beyond the physical materials, I think uh, what really needs to be behind that is supporting it. So supporting those ideas through affirmative judgment by saying yes and, and by, you know, um, by just really um, encouraging, encouraging that, that mindset where ideas are welcome, mistakes are welcomed, mistakes are even celebrated. You know, sometimes you could even, um, you know, have a little party or reward for, for making a mistake to show that that's okay, we want that. Um, because that is an opportunity for learning and for growth. So I think the attitude, the mindset, all of that plays an even bigger role because you could have a maker space, but if there isn't that feeling of being able to take a risk and try things, then it won't get used in a productive way. Absolutely. Positioning within the school life and within the family life, the importance of, of the trial and error, right? And to position it very well, uh, this trial and error approach as, as an approach to life as well. Could you perhaps comment a bit on this? Mm -hmm. I think I, I think that's a, a great point and it's a great question. I think it's a challenge. I mean, personally speaking, um, from a parenting perspective, it's really hard. I think it's hard to um, allow children to fail or to um, have that experience, but it it's important that and I think that's where the awareness piece comes in. I think sometimes there are opportunities where we, we need to sort of take a step back and get out of their way and let them try things. And um, I think, I mean, I, I wish I, in some ways, I mean, I was doing this research when my kids were young, but I almost wish that I had this before I even had children, because you can think about babies, you know, crawling or trying to roll over and they're, or they're trying to reach for something. And they're trying and they're trying and there's so much value to just stepping back and allowing that to happen. They might, you know, you might think they're struggling, but are they struggling or are they just reaching really hard until they get it? And they're so happy when they get it. Um, so often I think we can jump in and, you know, give them whatever it was they were reaching for. And, you know, we're taking away possibilities through that. So that would be an example of how, you know, we're taking away that condition or possibility for growth to happen. And so, yeah, I think, I do think it's a challenge. I'm, I'm going to be honest. It, it's hard, especially when they get older to allow that mm -hmm. um, experience to happen. But I think we need to try to be mindful of when there are safe times that we can allow that to happen. All right, there's a question and I love this question actually. It says, what do all these post-its behind you mean? And also when you saw your desk, we saw a lot of post-its and pens and the diagrams and the flow charts to, to help us or for you to explain this the structure. And, and what role, for example, do all these things that um, you have shown about your life in your desk and your post-its, what role do these have in your life? Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love that question. Well, um, I think these are tools, right? So when we learn about the creative process, and there is a very deliberate process that we can learn about, I wanted to include part of it, but there just wasn't enough time. Um, but there is a very deliberate process that we can learn about in terms of, you know, when you're working towards an opportunity or a challenge, 
um, how we can separate diverging from converging. And so we want to come up with as many possibilities and options before we start deciding on narrowing down our ideas. And so that's what this is. This is actually uh, my brainstorm wall for ideas for courses that I'm developing um, as a way of getting this work out to more people. Um, because I did that, re the research that I've done and the research that I've been reading about in academic journals and articles, there's so much value in them. And I'm just not sure, um, I mean, to a certain degree it gets out to the public, but oftentimes it's reserved for the academic community. And I think that there's an opportunity for more people to learn about these aspects and, and have some awareness around it. So that's my planning for workshops, um, courses, an online building out an online resource where I can offer more information. And so these are really, um, yeah, I've always got, have post-its nearby just to jot down ideas. and. The value of having um, these little sticky notes, or there are a lot of digital applications now that, that are wonderful brainstorm boards, um, technically, that have helped with the pandemic. Um, but the, the reason these are valuable is because you write one idea per note, and that way you can move them around and you can vote on your favorite ideas or the most um, the ideas that meet your objectives, and you can move them around and cluster them, and, and, um, and that's the value of having them uh, your ideas separated this way. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there are two questions to close off this session. The first question, which is actually the first question that appeared in the chat, it's about, about fantasy, about imaginary worlds, and how children are created perhaps within or really inside a fantasy story creating characters. Would that be a sign of a lot of creativity? Or how should we approach that reality that perhaps some parents and some educators are facing when children are uh, very much, well, they, they create their own fantasy world? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this question. Um, I can relate to this. When my daughter was really young, she wanted to get inside of the television set and be part of the, what was inside. And she want, you know, she had all sorts of ideas. And um, I'll be honest, I don't know exactly what the research says about this. I mean, I, I think that it shows a very rich imagination and it shows an ability to think outside of the usual and the norm. And I think that is something to be encouraged. I absolutely think that's a wonderful thing. Um, in terms of how far do we let it, you know, do we go? Do we, do we clarify that you can't jump into a television set? I mean, I, I can recall I, I was very encouraging of it and there was some frustration when she figured out that she couldn't do it. So um, we will run into those obstacles too. Um, but I, I would like to know more about whether research has been done in that on that, um, on that particular subject as far as to what degree do we encourage imagination versus, um, versus letting them know like the reality of things um, because I think there is some importance to creating some distinctions of what's you know the real versus fantasy. Um, yet when they're young, I think it's such a wonderful thing to encourage imagination and, and to encourage stories and how can you take that and you know put it into a story or, or document it in some way. Um, you know, maybe it would turn into a, a graphic novel like the, the young um, boy who got in trouble in class who is now a famous children's author. So you never know. Yes, and I think there are many, many stories like that. For example, when ex-alumni return to the schools and they share a lot of the, st uh, the stories about their lives, right, about their fantasy lives that they had in the schools and how the schools uh, basically requested so much more discipline from that and how their lives have a lot to do with that positive or creative thinking that they were so challenged for in schools. Mm -hmm. And I have a last question for you. And I don't know if it's perhaps a very complex question. It's about the following. We create a lot of emphasis, specifically when babies are born, right? And when children are in pre-K in the importance of routine and the importance of children having an autonomy as well in the their own time management in, in going from one activity to the other and for them to be able to do things calmly. That is more or less the approach that we have uh, in terms of routines in schools. And now looking back at your post-its and also taking into account uh, your, your chapter of the book, Anyways, the proposal that you're 
making on creativity is perhaps farther away from a perspective on on creativity as an eureka moment, as something that we need to find, something special that we need to find and something that perhaps wasn't seen before. So I am I'm under the impression that there is a process, a rigorous process actually, to find that creative thinking, to be able to enable it rather, both at home and school environments. Could you please perhaps comment a bit on on that perhaps that that myth of the eureka mom, moment of the creative person and the process that that it the process that it actually means to create uh, a creativity enabling environment and perhaps the rigorous uh, attitude it determines for the teachers and educators yes um so i think it's a yes and so i think that um you know the eureka moment a myth is actually, um, the myth is that the idea just pops into your head, but the reality is that a lot of work has gone into it. You've been incubating on ideas maybe for weeks or months or days, and then the idea comes. So it's having that opportunity. So <clears throat> I say yes, and because I think there's a deliberate approach that can be implemented to help, um, you know, with having some guidelines in place for how to come up with more ideas, how to stretch your thinking. But I think that there is also value to being in a flow state and having that space to explore and, and then having an idea come to you when you're ready to accept it also. So I think it can be both. And um, I see what you're saying about the school environment. Um, it reminds me of the Montessori method actually in terms of having a sense of order and, and having expectations. And I think that developmentally children go through those, you know, she calls them the sensitive periods, those stages where they want that sense of order and they, they want that. So I think to a certain degree that that is a really great thing to have. Um, I think one of the challenges in, in schools is that we are more constrained with um, scheduling and you can be working on something and having a great idea. And then, you know, oh, now it's time to go to gym class or, you know, you have to leave and interrupt that time. So that certainly is a challenge. Um, and that's why, again, Montessori has these longer work periods that are so lovely. Um, so I think there are, there are things that we can take from different educational models. Self-directed education models um, can be wonderful for allowing a child to explore their interests and curiosities and, and work on things that they're intrinsically motivated to do. So I think there are a lot, of, there's a lot of value we can take from different models out there. Um, so yeah, I think it's all of those things combined that, um, so there isn't necessarily a formula, I don't think, but I think that there's a lot of factors involved to be mindful of in order to encourage mm -hmm. this creative way of thinking. And I think it really starts with the leader, the facilitator, teacher, parent, being aware of it being um, you know, that create, you know, creative thinking is something that we want to value. And if we value it and have that attitude for it, then we can, we can be in a position to notice it and encourage it and celebrate it. In one of your texts, in which you explained a bit more at depth, the way or the formula that, that the created that creativity is in function of the attitude and knowledge, imagination, and the capacity of evaluating our own ideas. When you develop those aspects, you also include empathy. And I would like to know a bit more about the role that empathy has, the relationship with others, right? The fact that we work jointly, what role does that have in the process that you've exposed? in regards to creativity? Oh, I think that's a great question because empathy is so important. And actually really early in my parenting journey, I attended a seminar where I learned that empathy is not something, it's a skill that we learn and we develop. It's not something you automatically have. And, and it's something that you can deliberately work to improve. And I think um, empathy is very important for creativity because it's understanding different perspectives. It's being sensitive to feelings and emotions, which play into the creative process and having an awareness of, of different aspects of things. Um, and that actually just reminded me, I pulled out this poster that I, I created. It's based on creative thinking skill. Um, e. Paul Torrance, who is the father of creativity, um, set aside a number of creative thinking skills that are important for creativity. 
And um, being aware of emotions is one of those skills. It is very important to, to have that empathy towards others, to understand the real problem. So um, I invite families or children who are working on the um, the submission of solving a creative problem to really look at what's the problem and spending a lot of time there. Decide what is it that you really, what is the real problem that we want to solve? And that will help you, I think, come up with more unique solutions. Yeah, so really having that um, awareness, that empathy, different perspectives is very important. Pues, pues tenemos que cerrar ya. Me, me All right, we have to close off this session. I am very, very excited about the replies that you've just given because we sometimes think that that creativity is something, perhaps something more spontaneous, but the fact of finding ourselves with the other and solving problems together is always perhaps the objective from education as well and from from education to to build towards a better world and i think that's a task we currently have as educators so lina thank you very very much i i think we we all have a bunch of notes with us now after your talk and uh, also very much aware about attitudes and new approaches that we can include and that we can integrate towards our children our families and students and also the desire to really explore this creativity topic. Thank you very much, Lina. My pleasure. And thank you. And to all the attendees, thank you very much once again for joining us in this seminar. We are sure that everyone has as takeaways key tools and ideas to create school and family and home environments where the creative brain will definitely be protagonist. So this talk will be recorded in the Alcaparros School webpage. And it, we also have the following events that have to do with creativity amongst others. For example, you will find the other two previous conferences that are part of the PEOP event of the Bogota ed Technological Education. And this year, the School of Hacienda Los Alcaparros is the host of, the, of this event. So we, I want to thank all the different participants. I want to thank Lina, of course. I want to thank Sofia Ramirez as well, the organizer of the Creative Brain. And I wish you all a great weekend. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos en esta conferencia del coloquio El Cerebro Creativo. No olvide visitar nuestra página web www.alcaparros.edu.co para registrarse a la próxima charla a cargo del doctor Arnulfo Valdivia desde la creatividad a la innovación a la disrupción y conocer más sobre el llamado global por ideas creativas. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos.